Welcome to the final episode of our journey through Othello. We've made it to Act 5, Scene 2. Here we are. If you've listened to every single video, then have a virtual biscuit as a reward. But thank you for joining me and join me for this one. This is an amazing scene. It's really intense. Um, can be very difficult to watch. I think it's always difficult to watch. It's an amazingly powerful scene. Anyway, let's go for it. So we have straight away, so we can see the situation. Othello's coming in with a light. Desdemona's in her bed. It is the cause, it is the cause, my soul. And we have a lot of repetition here because it is the cause. So we have diacopy here where it's repeated, which is a word sandwich. Let me not name it to you, you chase stars. So this is a reference to chastity. And then the idea of Othello is addressing the heavens rather like he did earlier on in Act 4 with Iago. When they're kind of invoking the heavens. But the idea of Desdemona's infidelity here. I'll not shed her blood, nor scar that whiter skin of hers in snow and smooth as monumental alabaster. So I think actually, in a way, this is more kind of internalised racism from Othello because he's really linking Desdemona's beauty to her whiteness. And monumental alabaster is the kind of stone that would be used in a mausoleum you know, or a tomb. It's that kind of association that Shakespeare's going for. Then, I think Shakespeare invented like white as snow. Is this where it's come from? I think that's one of those Shakespeare coined phrases. I might be wrong about that. Don't quote me on it. Yet she must die, else she'll betray more men. Like lots of criminals, criminals are very good at coming up with justification for their actions. In this case, it's obviously a very kind of personal murder that's taking place here. But it's interesting that Othello is coming up with this justification as if he's an agent of of good. She must die, else she'll betray more men. It's, and it's also such a sense of his own self-importance here in terms of thinking he is in a position to be administering justice. In some ways taking the role of God, actually, you could argue. But this is, again, Iago has reprogrammed him to be like this. Put out the light and then put out the light. This is a very interesting line and it's got a really, a really spicy technique for you in here as well. So this is an example of Antana Clasis. Look at that. Put out the light and then put out the light. Antana Clasis. I think I'm going to write that one on. And there it is by the magic of YouTube just appearing before your very eyes. Antana Clasis, where you have the same... Words are repeated here, but repeated for different meanings. So you have the literally and figuratively. So put out the light as in put out the candlelight and then put out the light of Desdemona's life. Then we have this, if you took it really literally, quite a strange moment. When if you, if you kind of take it out of context and say Othello's talking to a candle, sounds a bit strange. But Shakespeare has Othello personifying this candle. If I quench thee, thou flaming minister... It works as, a, as an analogy, and minister's got connotations of court, so a sense of judgment here. It's like the candle is like a, an advisor, like a court advisor in many ways. I can again thy former light restore, should I repent me? So he's saying, if I turn out this, if I turn, <laughs> turn out, this, if I put out this candle, then I can light it again. And the analogy continues, but once put out thy light, it's a metaphor as well. Though cunning's pattern of excelling nature, I know not where is that Promethean heat that can thy light relume, as in like reilluminate. That means, so if I put out the light of, really this metaphor is extended from earlier on, put out the light and then put out the light. And then you're drawing on, Shakespeare's drawing on the legend of Prometheus, like stealing fire. It's linked to the power of creation. He can't bring Desdemona back to life once he kills her. When I have plucked the rose, 
go to the next page. I cannot give it vital growth again. And then in typical Shakespeare style, re-emphasizing the same ideas, in this case with a different, different metaphor, in case the audience missed it. Because remember, these were really designed for listening, really, in many ways. They did see it as a visual performance, but it was also an idea really of the audience hearing it was really important so sometimes that's why certain things get repeated that's why it seems long-winded sometimes because things have to be doubled or even tripled up sometimes if needs must wither i'll smell it on the tree oh balmy breath that dost thou almost persuade justice to break her sword so the more references to justice here justice being personified and the idea of he's smelling in the breath of desdemona and then thinking oh it's so wonderful it almost convinces me to not do what I'm going to do now. Justice to break her sword. So again, this is this this twisted logic of Iago where everything's been turned on its head. And he thinks he's an agent of good here. He kisses her one more, one more. Be thus the one art thou dead and I will kill thee and love thee after. So this actually feels paradoxical, actually. So he's going to destroy what he loves. But she wakes. Who's there, a fellow I, Desdemona? Will you come to bed, my lord? Have you prayed tonight, Desdemona? So, so notice Shakespeare has a fellow. It almost looks irrelevant, doesn't it? Answering a question with a question. Will you come to bed, my lord? Have you prayed tonight, Desdemona? I, my lord. And of course, the reason is, is this is the idea of say your prayers to seek repentance because he's going to kill her. And then that's why your soul will be ready to go to the afterlife. And in fact, this echoes Hamlet when Hamlet is delaying in terms of killing Claudius and he's worried that Claudius is praying to God. So if he kills him while Claudius is praying, then Claudius will be forgiven for his sins and go to heaven. But he wants the room to suffer in hell. And it's a very similar in some ways, it's maybe not necessarily a similar a similarity with that play or even a conscious reference to it. It's probably just more likely reflecting cultural beliefs of the time, really. So if you think of yourself any crime, unreconciled as yet to heaven and grace, solicit for it straight. So he's asking Desdemona to pray to God. But then again, a, flaw, a big flaw in their relationship has been a lack of clear communication. Really, what's happening here is there's a sense of circumlocution, which means kind of talking around something. Othello isn't directly accusing Desdemona of anything at this point. And again, I think that's worth typing in. And you're going to see this one typed in live. Here we go. Circumlocution. There you go. And that's talking around something. I would not kill thy unprepared spirit. No, heaven forbid, I would not kill thy soul. So he is making out he's being merciful. Desdemona, of course, realises what's going on here. She knows she's in danger. I didn't highlight that for some reason. But Shakespeare is emphasising how innocence as a victim here since guiltless i know not but yet i feel fear so she doesn't actually know think on thy sins so you know othello could actually just say directly couldn't he but it's still taking a long time to get to that point that death's unnatural that kills for loving so again this represents iago's poisoning of othello's mind because he was so in love with Desdemona, he would never, at the start of the play, he would never dream of doing this, of being in this situation. Then what's the matter? That handkerchief which I so loved and gave thee, thou gavest to Cassio. So the way that this is actually being presented is Desdemona saying, well, what's the problem? It says, well, a handkerchief which I loved and gave you, you gave to Cassio. Sounds like this is the reason he wants to kill her. So obviously there's a more of a breakdown in miscommunication here because Desdemona is completely unaware of what Othello's been thinking. Noble my life and soul, send for the man and ask him. Sweet soul, take heed, take heed of perjury. So more, look at that, more legal Lexis. Perjury is to lie in court. Othello, again, in some ways, this echoes the the first act at the end of the first act when Othello is standing him standing up for himself in the Venetian court. Now he has cast himself as a twisted prosecutor he's actually everything he's judge jury and executioner all rolled into one so there's all of this legal language coming through thou art on my deathbed we still she still doesn't know exactly what's being accused of here apart from giving a handkerchief to someone which she says she hasn't actually done 
confess freely of uh, confess thee freely of thy sin. Uh, thou art to die. So this is again that is even Shakespeare is presenting that as that's like a final judgment, isn't it? There's a real sense of finality to that. She's been found guilty in the court of Othello. I say, Amen. And you have mercy too. I never did offend you in my life. Never loved Cassio. It's a general warranty of heaven as I might love. I never gave him token. I saw my handkerchief in his hand. So remember about Iago had said, you know, to jealous people, these small, these small tokens, these small things seem monumentally important. And that's what's happening here is Othello seeing that handkerchief as evidence, as solid evidence, as the ocular proof that he demanded from Iago as well. He wanted this ocular proof to see and know that his wife had been unfaithful. But th this is so insubstantial. Actually, if you're feeling, I'm feeling a bit frustrated, actually, even as I'm talking about and analysing it. But this is really deliberate. Shakespeare's playing on this. This is how the tragedy is working, because this this imminent death of Desdemona is so, it's so senseless and so needless. Uh, you want the audience to be engaged like this and think, so, you know, you just don't want this to happen. You don't want this, this is all so avoidable. I always think a really good production when you're watching a Shakespearean tragedy, like I've seen productions where it's really good, where you're so caught up in it, you're watching it and you partially think like, maybe it's not going to turn out bad this time. Maybe it's going to be okay. And that's the power of the writing and of the acting and the directing and all of the production. Sometimes they can pull that off and they can make you think that it's not going to happen in the same way that it's happened every single time. Because you're so invested emotionally in the play. You don't get it off of the page like this on one of my YouTube videos or anywhere else or just reading it off the page. In performance is where the real gold is. So he found it then. I never get this is actually completely logical, isn't it, from Desdemona? Send for him here, then let him confess a truth. He hath confessed that he have used thee. Well, this is actually not true. This is all again, this links to the whole theme of the play we've seen of altered perceptions, of reprogrammed perceptions, perceptions of reality versus falsehood. He will not say so. No, his mouth is stopped. Honest Iago hath taken order for it. So he thinks Cassio is dead, remember thinks that Cassio is dead. So again, that's another good one for altered perceptions. Had all his hairs been lives, my great revenge had stomach for them all. So a great example of hyperbole here. Shakespeare's use for Othello's desire for revenge. You're saying that if um, all of his hairs had been lives, he would have taken revenge on every single one of those lives, you know, as many as he's got hair. Alas, he is betrayed and I, as in hair, as in individual hairs on his head. I didn't explain that very well, sorry. Outstrumpet, so using this sexist, misogynistic language that Iago has really put into Othello's mind. Banish me, my lord, but kill me not. I, I don't know, this is one of those things I think is a bit of a push. So that's why she says that banish me, lord, but kill me So she's seeing a bit of... Uh, you may not even find this useful enough to write down. I'm going to say it anyway. But there's, there's a little bit in this, it really reminds me of the Arabian Nights. And I am i can't help but wonder, I mean, this is a story that would have been available in that era. I can't help but wonder if there's a sense of Desdemona being like the princess in that story who, is it Sherazamad, I can't remember the name now, who extends her life by telling stories um, kill me tomorrow, let me live tonight. And, and I'm saying this because of Othello's Islamic background. Is that a, a is, is this an, a sort of subtle echo of the Arabian Nights? I wonder, I can't, I don't know. I don't know, it's just, this is just me. I've always felt this. I've not read that anywhere or seen anything. I'm not saying I'm some kind of amazing genius for having this completely original idea. Someone probably may have thought of it elsewhere. I don't know. Or it could just be a load of rubbish and I'm exaggerating and I don't know, I'm just, it just, just makes me think of it. It's my video, I'm going to say it. Then, while I say one prayer, then, uh, so again, Desdemona's innocence. Then, my Lord, what hope, my Lord, my Lord, what noise is this? Not dead, not yet quite dead. And I missed out the whole point, the bit where it says he smothers her. Uh, 
Shakespeare wouldn't have written that in actually. If there's a bit of disruption there, I had to pause it because there was a very loud vehicle outside and it distracted me. Anyway, what noise is this? Not dead, not quite, sorry, not yet quite dead. I am, I that am cruel, am yet merciful. So there is a sense here again of his own justice, but maybe actually a recognition here in similar way to Iago of recognising his own cruelty. The sense of how Iago recognises himself as a villain. So he's, he is smothering there's the man. He hasn't actually quite killed her yet. So I should be clear about that. So he smothers her. He hasn't quite killed her. He's trying to kill her. So at this point. So then Amelia turns up. So we get Shakespeare is dangling these glimmers of hope of Desdemona's survival. That things could actually be all sort of sorted out. Tis Amelia. She's dead. Tis like she comes to speak of Cassio's death. The noise was here. Ha, no more moving. Still as a grave. Like, this is... Look at the uncertainty in the language here. All of these rhetorical questions. I think she stirs again real uncertainty about whether he's killed her. And then uncertainty in his own mental state. What's best to do? She comes, she'll sure speak to my wife. My wife? My wife? What wife? I have no wife. Look at this repetition, this parallel phrasing here. Look at this. He's now, like, she's not alive anymore. She's not, she's not my wife anymore. She was my wife. He's in a state of turmoil. His mind is so inconsistent, he can't concentrate. Oh, insupportable, oh, heavy hour. I mean, he thinks it should now be a huge eclipse of sun and moon and that the authoritative globe should yawn at alteration. So there's more links here to celestial events, as in you know, of the stars and the heavens, that like her death should be marked by a huge eclipse. Amelia is coming in and we go, we go through... What now? But now, my lord, is the very error of the moon. She comes more nearer earth than she was wont and makes men mad. The foul murders, is this as a reference to? Sorry, I did that in the wrong order, but you understand. And so there's the idea of, this is actually where the word lunatic comes from, actually. The idea that it's the moon influencing people's minds. That's where it comes from. So actually more celestial language, more of the, you know, linked to like the ideas about astronomy and things, you know, the idea of the heavens influencing people on Earth. Cassio, my lord, hath killed a young Venetian called Rodrigo. Rodrigo killed and Cassio killed. Oh, look, a little bit of epistrophe or epiphora, if you prefer, as the term, the repetition there as well. No, Cassio is not killed. So this actually, again, you could see this as Shakespeare having Othello trying to define reality but actually Amelia is the one who actually defines reality. No, Cassio is not killed. Not Cassio killed? Then murders out of tune and sweet revenge grows harsh. Oh, falsely, falsely murdered. So Desdemona actually revives. In, in a very, the deaths are very extended in this final scene, but it's more dramatic. It's not necessarily meant to be realistic. It's heightened, almost like really melodramatic in many ways. It's not meant to be realistic. It's going for the full emotional punch onto the audience. Out out the last of my lady's voice. Help, ho, help. Oh, lady, speak again. Sweet does the moment. Oh, mistress, speak. A guiltless death I die. Who hath done this deed? Nobody. I myself. Farewell. Commend me to my kind lord. Oh, farewell. And we have Desdemona's innocence is so complete that even in death, she is not willing to blame Othello for what she's done. I think Shakespeare's drawing on Christian imagery here and the idea of Desdemona's sacrifice and self-sacrifice and her total, complete goodness, her innate goodness, that she won't even condemn her husband in death. It could be in some ways that Iago is to blame you know, indirectly there and there's a recognition of it being Iago's fault you could argue that's another thing to unpack with this last scene as well and you heard her say herself it was it was not I this is again like Othello in some ways Shakespeare has Othello almost adopting the Iago, Iago tactics and really and really failing actually Iago will make opportunities, doesn't he? He makes the most of opportunities and Othello is trying to do that and not really doing so. She said so. I must need to report the truth. 
So Amelia is very perceptive and very intelligent. She's like a liar gone to burning hell. Twas I that killed her. So he very quickly abandoned the cover story and then just accepts his own. That he actually did it. Oh, the more angel she and you, the blacker devil. Now, of course, this is a huge one for there's antithesis here, angel and devil. But then notice that race is tied into it. You, the blacker devil. So Othello's, Othello's blackness and his ethnicity is linked to evil here. She turned to folly and she was a whore, is Othello's summation of her. So she turned to folly and she was a whore. So this is, again, ideas about kind of defining reality. She was as false as water, presumably because water has a reflective quality and it, <laughs> and it wobbles. That's like a terrible dis description, isn't it? But, and that's the idea, false as water. It's a, it's a fake image. There are rash as fire. So Amelia, nice antithesis here from Shakespeare. So false as water, rash as fire. So drawing on elemental imagery, the elements themselves, they are tied to astronomy and the heavens. It's all, that's the nature of reality or the nature of Shakespeare's contemporary society's reality. Then I would down beneath all depth in hell, but though I did proceed upon just grounds to this extremity, very legal language. Thy husband knew it all. My husband, thy husband. So more parallel phrasing here. That she was forced to wear that eye with Cassio. She had been true. Amelia works out very quickly what's going on here. Because she's had her suspicions for a long time about her husband. If heaven would make this another world of one entire and perfect chrysolite. It's diamond, I believe. And the idea I would not sold her for it. This, this actually echoes back to Amelia's own lines about all the wealth in the world earlier on in act four i twas he that told me on her first an honest man he is and hates the slime that sticks on filthy deeds that's a, that's a great line hates the slime it's a metaphor my husband what needs this so there's lots of emphasis on on marriage here actually in this scene of being husbands and being wives and what it means to be a husband and what it means to be a wife as well and the bonds that husbands and wives have together so really it's another theme of the play it's not as conscious a theme as other ones but actually it is a theme of the play what needs this iterance woman i say or iterance i say thy husband oh mistress villainy hath made hath made mocks with love my husband say she was false so there's suspense shakespeare is deliberately having this drawn out with these questions with these interrogatives and it's drawing out the suspense to say, well, here's the moment when Amelia is going to reveal, when is Othello going to find out he's been tricked? My friend, thy husband, honest, honest Iago. So there's a bit of epizuxis for emphasis there. Thank you, Shakespeare. If he says so, so may his pernicious soul rot half a grain a day. He lies to the heart. She was too fond of her most filthy bargain. And this again is more actually more kind of racial derogatory language to Othello saying she's she was really good Iago was awful he lies to the heart and she was too fond of of Othello who has turned into her killer and the filthy bargain is a derogatory way of describing their marriage as in Othello and Desdemona's marriage ha do thy worst this deed of thine is no more worthy no more worthy heaven than thou wast worthy her that's going to sting as well that line so Amelia, strong female character here, standing up for herself against Othello, who is armed, bear that in mind as well. She's not afraid to speak the truth. Thou hast not half that power to do me harm as I have to be her. Oh, gull, oh, dull. Gull is basically being gullible. As ignorant as dirt. I care not for thy sword. She's fearless. Amelia is fearless. I make thee known, though I lost 20 lives. Help, help, ho, help. The more hath killed my mistress. Murder, murder. So Amelia shouts out to attract attention. We have Montano, Graciano and Iago. So good old Montano's back. Are you come, Iago? You have done well. That men must lay their murders on your neck. Significant. Look, it's Amelia who is calling out her husband. She is the one who is exposing. So that is crimes to everyone. Disprove this villain if thou hast been a man. He says thou told him that his wife was false. I know thou didst not. 
Thou art, thou art not such a villain. Speak, for my heart is full. I told him what I thought and told no more than what he found himself was apt and true. Iago in this scene speaks, he's in it, he, he really speaks less than any other point of the play, basically. Uh, he really keeps his mouth shut, really, as much as he can. And this is, again, good for ideas about perceptions of reality. I did. Do you tell him she was false? I did. You told a lie, an odious, damned lie. She forced with Cassio. Did you say with Cassio? With Cassio, which was go to, charm your tongue. Or not charm my tongue. So notice how you've got a stichomythia, or I have sometimes heard it pronounced as stichomythia as well, but anyway, stichomythia. These, oh, hey, what we're we doing there? With these quick fire, very professional as ever, these quick fire exchanges, and notice how they echo each other as well, because they are husband and wife. Amelia is the half of the soul that is good and Iago is half of the soul that is bad as in their souls are are linked because they're married so we have villainy 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 more epizuxis more diacopy I, th I think I spoke I think upon it I think I smell it oh villainy I thought so then I'll kill myself for grief oh villainy villainy what are you mad I charge you get you home so goes misogynistic responses to send her back home and to keep her quiet just proper obeying but not now so her contextually her duty as a wife would be to do as Iago says but she's not going to do that now I will never go home so implying that she will never be with him ever again oh 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 the fellow falls on the bed is this linked to his name maybe I don't know was oh so maybe the fellow falls on the bed. Oh, she was foul. I scarce did know you, uncle. There lies your niece, whose breath indeed these hands have newly stopped. So this is a really strange way to uh, meet his wife's uncle. So, <laughs> Graciano, poor Desmond, I'm glad my father's dead. So, remember the old racist Brabantio. Well, he would... He would be really upset. He would probably die right now anyway, even if he was upset. Sorry, even if he was alive, he'd be that upset. Tis pitiful. Now, this mirrors Othello's discussion of how he and Desdemona actually fell in love. But yet Iago knows that she, with Cassio, hath the act of shame a thousand times committed... So he's still clinging on to this false reality as painted by Iago. Cassio confessed it. And then there's all this handkerchief reference. Well, an antique token my father gave my mother. Oh God, oh heavenly God. So she's going to expose the truth. Oh thou dull moor, that handkerchief thou speaks of, I found by fortune and do give my husband... For often with a solemn earnestness, more than indeed belonged to such a trifle, he begged me to steal it. So she she suspected it was very strange how Iago really wanted this handkerchief. Iago addresses his own wife with this strong, misogynistic, pejorative language. She gave it to Cassio. No, alas, I found it and did give it my husband. Filth thou liest. So there's still a battle about maintaining the artificial truth here. Oh, murderous coxcomb. Coxcomb is what jesters would wear. Or fools, as they were also known. What should such a fool do with so good a wife? There are no stones in heaven, but what serves for the thunder? Precious villain. The war runs at Iago, but is disarmed. Iago kills his wife. So just to make clear, again, Shakespeare didn't write that, but it helps us understand what's happened. The woman falls. Sure, he hath killed his wife. So thanks, Graciano, for informing the audience exactly what's happened there. And Amelia gets her own drawn-out death of saying, lay me by my mistress' side. Iago's gone. He's gone, but his wife's killed. Tis a notorious villain. Take you this weapon which I have here recovered from the moor. Come guard the door without him. Let him not pass, but kill him rather. I'll after that same villain, for tis a damned slave. So they're going to go and hunt down Iago.
then Amelia gets her, which is like her swan song, really, as she's dying. What did thy song bode, lady? So this ref refers to refers to Desdemona's song, the Willow song. She sings Willow, Willow, Willow. That foreshadowed the death that we are seeing now. She loved thee cruel more, so come my soul to bliss as I speak true. So speaking as I think, alas, I die. <laughs> she dies. So Amelia heroically exposed Iago's lies and confronted Othello and bravely stood up to Othello. I have another weapon in this chamber. It is a sword of Spain, the ice brook's temper. This is interesting because a lot of the, a lot of this play is about the merging of the military and the dis and the domestic sphere, and you could argue that a lot of the problems of the play stem from that mixing of those two worlds, and symbolically, Othello has a special sword hidden. Icebrook's temper sounds like Toledo steel to me, the type of special, a kind of luxurious exotic metal that would be used for swords in that era. Um, and Sword of Spain, the Icebrook's temper. So he's got a sword in his bedroom. That, to me, sounds again like symbolic of mixing of the military and, and the domestic sphere. So he's got another sword. If thou attempt it, it will cost thee dear. Thou hast no weapon and perforce must suffer. Looking upon me, then speak with me, or naked as I am, well, I will assault thee. So Othello is potentially armed and dangerous, but... Behold, I have a weapon. A better never did itself sustain upon a soldier's thigh. I have seen the day that this with little arm and this good sword, I have made my way through more impediments than 20 miles your stop. So Othello's identity has been effectively like deconstructed by Iago. And now you've got it being Othello effectively in his great failure here, in this great tragic moment. He is actually in some ways trying to reconstruct it he's going back into the past effectively talking about the amazing military feats that he's actually performed in the past so he's saying you know i can get through you i've fought off 20 men with this sword i could easily get through you but oh vain boast who can control his fate is not so now be not afraid though you do see me weapon here is my journey's end here is my button my very sea mark my utmost sail do you go back dismayed is a lost fear man but a rush against the fellow moment when he was effectively trying to reclaim rest and he retires where should Othello go he's he's realized that time's run out for him there's nothing he can do there's no way back from what he's done he realizes but there is his military past and his identity as a soldier because he's also he's lost his identity as a husband hasn't he now then he's got his soldier identity now he realizes he can't fight his way out of this situation his identity as a soldier has gone. So in many ways, you could say that Shakespeare is establishing this as, uh, as Othello's, not Shakespeare's, Othello's complete kind of loss of identity. So we have this moment of realisation, cold, cold, my girl, even like thy chastity, O cursed, cursed slave, whip me, you devils, as if Othello knows that he's going to go to hell. From the possession of this heavenly sight, blow me about in winds, roast me in sulphur. Sulphur is something you associate with hell. Smells really bad as well. You might know that if you're a scientist. Wash me in steep down gulfs of liquid fire. Oh, Desdemon, dead Desdemon. There's a kind of pun here. Dead O-O. And I think that is linking to Othello himself there as well. So he now, his new reality is realising that he's killed Desdemon and that whatever he does now... He has committed a sin. He has committed a terrible sin. He has killed Desdemona. He's going to go to hell. There's no way out for him. Actually, that's almost certainly because the hell is in the middle of Othello, isn't it? Hell in the middle would be in the middle there. I know the T is missing as well, but I think, yeah, that seems symbolic to me. Where is this rash and most unfortunate man? So remember what I said about loss of identity. That's he that was Othello. Here I am. So he's lost his identity now completely. Whereas that viper, bring the villain forth, and that's Iago. They've captured him. I look down towards his feet, but that's a fable. I love this image here. This is a cultural reference. He's looking at Iago's feet, expecting to see hooves, as if he's actually the devil. If that thou beest a devil, 
I cannot kill thee. He stabs Iago. So anyway, he does, he does kill him, but we could say, well, he tries to kill him anyway. He doesn't, he tries to kill him. He doesn't actually, I bleed, sir, but not killed. Thanks, Iago. This implies that actually he is a devil. If you look at it, if that thou be is the devil, I cannot kill thee. So the fact that he tries to kill Iago, but he actually doesn't die, does that mean within the logic of the world of the play, that means that Iago, who has been drawing, or Shakespeare's had Iago draw on devil imagery, he is evil? He is not evil. He is the devil? He, we know he's evil. I was going to say, the reason I went off and said that is because I was thinking of him as an agent of evil, and my mind jumped ahead slightly. O oh, thou a fellow that weren't once so good, fall in the practice of a damned slave, what shall be said to thee? And I think there's definitely connections here to Othello's race as well. And linking his terrible action with yeah, his ethnicity and that's the prejudices reflected of the time. So we have this wretch hath part confessed his villainy. He's also, this is Iago, he's also described here as a demi-devil, so like a half-devil. Why has he thus instead my soul and body? Demand me nothing. What you know, you know. From this time forth, I will never speak, I never will speak word. So Iago, who has used his language ability, is his manipulative speech. Ironically now, Shakespeare presents him as, this is it. He doesn't say anything after this point. If you were expecting a big speech from Iago explaining why he did it all and all of his motivations and everything, we're not going to get it. So Shakespeare is deliberately holding that information back. I always feel that Iago is just an agent of evil and it doesn't necessarily even need a motive. He is evil. He's just pure evil and he is an agent of evil and a and a kind of representative of the devil because I think that's how it's framed in Shakespeare's era. In Shakespeare's time, they would have absolutely no problem with that as a concept. Of course, modern audiences are more into our villains having proper concrete motives because that makes them more interesting. If they're a sort of moustache twirling baddie, it's not very satisfying. So in the modern age, we like to get it. And Iago does bear uh, psychoanalytical analysis and thinking about him, you know, actually psychological analysis and thinking about him in that way. And you're perfectly welcome to do that and look for his motives and speculate about his motives. But personally, my view is, is that he is just an agent of evil and that's enough. He doesn't need anything else. And as Michael Caine says, playing Alfred in The Dark Knight, isn't it? Some men just want to see the world burn. Anyway, that's what I think Iago's like. So we have, here's some evidence. Here is a letter found in the pocket of the slain Rodrigo and here another. So here's some evidence. The death of Cassio to be undertook by Rodrigo. So it condemns Iago, who isn't actually dead. He's just injured. Rodrigo meant to have sent this damned villain, so that would have been the evidence there. How came you, Cassio, by that handkerchief that was my wife's? So Cassio is here to explain everything as well. And even now he spake, after long seeming dead, Iago hurt him, Iago set on him. You must forsake this room and go with us. Your power and your command is taken off and Cassio rules in Cyprus. So Othello loses his identity He's killed his wife, he's lost his rank, he's lost everything. Cassio is now going to be in charge because he was only injured and not actually dead. And you've got you should your close prison arrest so that the nature of your fault be known to the Venetian state. So Othello is going to be... Actually, Shakespeare's created a connection to the start of the play, actually, hasn't he, as well? Othello's fate lies with the Venetian court. He's going to find himself back there. So there's deliberate cohesion created by Shakespeare, connecting the beginning of the play with the end of the play, and the end of the play with the beginning of the play. It's a circle. Soft you, a word or two before you go. I've done the state some service, and they know it. No more of that. I pray you in your letters, and you shall these unlucky deeds relate, speak of me as I am. Nothing extenuate, nor set down aught in malice. 
then you must do speak of one that loved not wisely, but too well. This reminds me of when, you know, when Othello says, rude am I in my speech, and he makes out he's potentially not very good at public speaking, and then delivers an excellent speech defending himself. This feels like more, more you know, the eloquent Othello has returned. So part of his former self has returned here. But you can look at this unfavorably and think, well, really, this is this is completely inappropriate. He's saying, oh, just... You know, I, I might have killed my wife, but remember to tell the Venetian state that I have actually been really useful in the past and done really good things. And and then to sum him up, what of one that loved not wisely, but too well. The kind of quotation that would make a brilliant exam question, actually, isn't it? You could see that integrated into a question of one that loved not wisely, but too well. So you, you might find this defence of himself rather thin, to be honest. And you could say this justification actually is still really a sign of him being manipulated by Iago rather than completely clear, full honesty about what he's done. You might expect him to be more humble, you know, show a bit more humility here. Of not one easily jealous, but being wrong. I mean, this is true. You could see this. OK, well, actually, the other side of the coin is maybe Shakespeare is trying to emphasise of saying, OK, before he was corrupted... Othello is, was a good man who was corrupted by Iago so hey audience don't forget that he was actually a decent guy and not really a villain even though he's been driven to do something terrible and in some ways you could say the the play is a warning to everyone of saying don't allow yourself to be manipulated by evil evil actors I don't mean actors as in performers but you know as in as in artist actors I mean as in evil agents who can manipulate you don't let yourself be misled and led to do evil things by others like the base judean with it this is actually possibly indian actually as in american indian is what they would mean in that era because obviously they didn't understand about the world and geography and the shape of the world and everything they didn't quite understand well they did understand they knew the earth was round by this point but they called Indians because they thought that was East. And anyway, it's all confused. The New World, they were confused where things were. But they had this idea of where, uh, like the base Judean or Indian, threw a pearl away richer than all his tribes. So this is linking to the idea of pagan cultures as they would be perceived by Europeans and not realising how valuable jewels and and... Uh, like a pearl would actually be and would throw it away but of course ironically really these things aren't really worth it it's only the human perception that's put on it anyway that's another story and it is literally another story because that is satirized in Gulliver's Travels which is one of my favorite favorite books then we have a bit unused to the melting mood drops tears as fast as the Arabian trees their medicinal gum so this is all linking to Othello's past it's linking to his uh, Islamic heritage it's linking to his African heritage as well but it's also linking to we've got an idea of where a malignant and turban Turk beat a Venetian traduced the state I took by the throat the circumcised dog and smote him thus so he's reminding that he's reminding the Venetians here that he served the state and that when a Venetian was was beaten and hurt and insulted by by a Turk that he defended him. And so you could link this to the idea of Othello's own, again, very thin defence of himself in this state. Or you could take it from a contemporary perspective and think about, well, the audience might actually be impressed with that, actually, if they're thinking about it, if it OK, because they would be... They would be very wary of other faiths and very prejudiced against other faiths, including Islam, of course, as well. But then ironically, they did have the Moorish ambassadors and again in London in the era. And Othello may have actually been inspired by those Moorish ambassadors in London in Shakespeare's time, which I think I talked about on an earlier video. It's been a long journey with these videos, so... I can't remember if I did ever talk about it, but anyway, hopefully I did. It's a long time ago. 
So then he stabs himself. So he's also there's there is a thing where it can be seen culturally uh, in Shakespeare's era, the idea of a heroic character taking his own life can be perceived as a kind of heroic or noble act in a weird way. And the other thing about it, though, is in Shakespeare's time, it would be seen as a way of you, you're going to go to hell because taking your own life would be seen as yeah fast track to hell, basically. So Othello was already going to go that way anyway, so maybe that's another part of it, of why he does it. Oh, bloody period, all that spoke is marred. I kiss thee, we get another drawn out death. So as he's dying, I, ki I kiss thee ere I killed thee. So I kiss thee before I killed, I killed her or killed you, he's addressing. He's using an intimate pronoun there and it's parallel phrasing there from Shakespeare. No way but this, my, killing myself to die upon a kiss. There's a heroic couplet here as well, so it rhymes. He dies. This did I fear, but thought he had no weapon, for he was great of heart, so he had a little hidden a hidden knife there. O oh, Spartan dog, more fell than anguish, hunger or the sea, look on the tragic loading of this bed. This is thy work. I think there's deliberately kind of echoes of the idea of a, a twisted version of God's work, if you see what I mean. This is his work. This is the devil's work, what he's done. The object poison sight, let it be hid. So this suggests that then the dead bodies are all covered. Gratiano, keep the house and seize upon the fortunes of the moor, for they succeed on you. So Gratiano, because he's Desdemona's uncle, he's inheriting everything. It's a weird little line, like in case anyone was bothered. That, oh, what's going to happen to... What's going to happen to Othello's money? Like in this really emotional, huge scene, there's this this weirdly little um, little factual financial nugget of saying, okay, Graciano's going to get everything. Yeah, we don't care. Graciano, who are you, mate? You know, anyway, sorry. It just seems a very odd little sidestep in a very tense emotional scene. Who am I to doubt what Shakespeare's doing? I'm sure he knows exactly what he's doing there. It's probably to... Give us a, a temporary bit of relief, probably. Think of, like, life going on, probably. Look, I'm trying to think of a good reason. To you, Lord Governor, remains the censure of this hellish vision. Sorry, hellish vision? This hellish villain. The time, the place, the torture, oh, enforce it. So more parallel phrasing there as well. So that's what's going to happen to Iago, who is, there's a nice pre-modifier there of hellish. Myself was straight aboard and to the state this heavy act with heavy heart relates. So there's another rhyming couplet here, heroic couplet at the end. Myself was straight aboard and to the state this heavy act with heavy heart relates. And it's more parallel phrasing there as well. So Ludovico is going to go back and report it back to the Venetian Senate. And that is the end of the whole play. So you may have stopped listening already. If you're still listening, I would like to say thank you, especially if you've listened to every single one of these i hope you i really do hope you find them useful i have enjoyed making them i've found out lots of interesting things and thought of things i've never thought of before as i i have taught the play many times in the past but i always say whenever i revisit a shakespeare play or see a new production there is always always something new every time and i hope that i have shared some of my enthusiasm for Shakespeare here with you and I invite you to join me on future videos and also visit my other videos I've got other ones as well the next one after this will be there will be another Shakespeare one I'm going to do as well after this one anyway so fare thee well and beware <laughs> beware people who seem to be really honest <laughs> is that the message that we can have from it but anyway thank you and goodbye <laughs>